going to go ahead and get started because we got a lot to go through tonight. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Kevin Richardson. I'm with Halt the Harm Network. Uh, we're hosting this with Frack Talker Alliance, and we are extremely excited to be hosting this event tonight. Uh, this film in particular, I think, shows the power of community organizing in the fight against the oil and gas movement, or oil and gas industry, as well as um, the shows some interesting things about some of the approaches to that fight that are perhaps underexplored, such as rights to nature. Um, and it also, I think, is a great example of what the potential harms are of injection wells, which are oftentimes not as emphasized as fracking directly. Um, so we're really excited. It's a very powerful film. We're glad that everyone has shown their interest in tonight and is joining us tonight. I'm going to run through the agenda and talk about the run of show real quick, and then I'll get out of everyone's way. So here we go. So we're going to start with a quick introduction from one of the co-directors of the film, Justin Grubb. Then we're going to move on to the film screening itself. Uh, and so we're going to do this a little differently. I'll explain once we get to that point exactly how it's going to happen. But we're not going to do a screen share. Instead, we're going to send out um, and we're going to send out a link for everyone to watch individually on their computer. And the reason we're doing that is because this film is absolutely beautifully shot. It has great sound, great um, visual quality, and you just lose that when you share it on, on Zoom. So it's great that everyone's going to watch it together simultaneously, and then we're going to come back for the panel discussion. So we'll have a, a moderated panel discussion, at which point we'll also share the calls to action that are still relevant um, to the fight with involving Grant Township. Then we'll move on to audience Q&A, and that will mostly close us out. And once we're done, we're going to have opportunity for folks who are interested to stick around and record some short messages of encouragement for Judy and Stacy. So uh, if you're interested in sticking around for that, you can hang on afterwards and we'll explain that. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Justin Grubb to explain uh, the film a little bit and talk about how he got involved with it. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Kevin, for uh, getting all of this together and getting everyone here in front of this film. I really appreciate everybody who's come and tuned in to watch this film. It really means a lot to all of us that you're, you know, interested in this, learning about what's going on and all of that good stuff. So, yes. So like Kevin said, I'm the co-director of this film. Um, you know, this film has been a nice project that we've been working on for about two years now, but it really started when I first graduated college. One of my first jobs was to be a wildlife biologist, and I actually worked with hellbenders. And, you know, during a period of a few years, I released hundreds of hellbenders down into Southern Ohio, which was like super rewarding. There were these little tiny hellbenders, uh, you know, two years old, you know, wiggling around, you know, um, we had taken the eggs out of the wild because they didn't have much, a uh, very high success rate. And we reared them in captivity and then put them back out in the wild where they had more success as, you know, acclimating to their environment as a two-year-old hellbender. And so while we were doing that, uh, we were also noticing a lot of, you know, construction in the area that was you know, causing a lot of harm to the hellbender habitat, you know, things like putting in pipelines that were causing landslides into these streams and river systems that would, you know, put all this sediment in the water, which is bad for the hellbenders, you know, they need clear water, they need access to rocks, so they can create their little den inside. And if you smother that they can't get to the rocks, because they're not able to really burrow down and create their own burrows, they need naturally occurring ones. So we were seeing that, we were seeing a lot of fracking activity, we were seeing um, just a lot of construction equipment moving around and stuff. And as the years went on, that kind of stuff started increasing. Um, and then, you know, I kind of focused my career more on science communication and storytelling and working with communities. But that like, that challenge for the Hellbender was always with me. And so when I was in a position to be able to kind of tell this story, uh, we worked with the Wildlands Collective, which is a great group of filmmakers, um, pitched the story, worked on funding, and we were able to decide, you know, this is the story that we want to tell. We want to talk about hellbenders. We want to talk about communities fighting environmental injustice. So we want to talk about fracking, try to put it all together. Um, and we had a couple initial concepts, but then, you know, one of our characters in that film was Judy and Stacy from Grant Township. And once we went down there and hung out with them, interviewed them, we realized very quickly that that was the story. Those are our main characters in this film. And so that's kind of how the film um, sort of came together uh, to be what it is today. So I'm really excited to share it with you guys. And I'm really excited for the 
the Q&A session at the end because I really enjoy talking about this, this subject. And it's great that we have so many experts here to be able to kind of talk about their role in the film or talk about what's going on with the legal struggles of Grant Township. So yeah, thanks for all, everyone for being here. I'm really excited. While people are getting back in there, I invite uh, anyone to share their reactions to the film in the chat. I'll give you mine really briefly. I uh, There's so much to take away from this film, but for me, the, the last scene where Stacy and Judy meet the salamander is so powerful for, personally, because I feel like uh, in this movement, so much of it is about, you know, you have a victory and then you go to the next fight, or you don't have a victory and you go to the next fight, mm -hmm. or there's these blooming challenges above us that it's rare that we have these moments to, of joy to share together and be able to share that all with y'all tonight. Um, to me, is very powerful um, to see that moment when they, um, when they touched and hold the salamander, it just, it was beautiful. So, uh, you know, feel free to drop your, um, your reactions to the film in the chat, let us know what you think of it. We're gonna to move to the um, panel discussion portion of, of the event. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen one more time and introduce our panel and our moderator. Um, so we're gonna do a panel discussion and then this is gonna be a really sh rather short one. We'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on this and then move to audience Q&A. And the way we do audience Q&A is through the chat. So I'm starting now through the whole panel discussion and into the audience Q&A, I feel free, I encourage everyone to drop their questions in the chat and go ahead and start getting those in there and then we'll answer those during the Q&A. Um, but this is really special because we have quite a few people involved in the film um, together for the first time to discuss it uh, in the screening. Uh, as Justin mentioned to me, usually these screenings are done where one person from the film will go off uh, and do a talk and a screening, but it's rare we get so many people together. So this is really special. We have Ted Out from Frackbecker who saw in the film. He would be our moderator asking questions. We have Justin Grubb, um, who is the co-director with Annie Roth. He'll be here to answer questions. We have Chad Nicholson from the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and he worked closely with Stacy and Judy uh, with the organizing, has supported their, their efforts um, for quite a while, and he'll be able to update us on what's happening. And then we have Matthew Connert, who you saw in the film, uh, who's a biologist, uh, salamander, or hellbender expert um, from University of Ohio, uh, which we're excited to have him here too. So I'm gonna pass it to, to Ted. And Ted, if you could just introduce yourself really briefly and maybe talk about Frack Trucker's role in this a little bit. And I'll I'll drop a link to Frack Trucker Alliance if y'all um, haven't connected with them yet. They're a great resource and they do such incredible work. So I'll pass it to Ted. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing movie. Um, I think my background in this is uh, I've been at Frack Tracker for over a decade now. Uh, I spent a lot of time down in Belmont County, Ohio, where the last remaining uh, population of the Hellbender Salamander is in the state. Um, I have several friends that live down in Captina Creek down in Belmont on the Belmont Monroe border. And um, that is also an area where fracking has boomed. It's also an area where all the gathering pipelines have kind of decimated much, you know, significant chunks of landscape. So it was really great to hear from Justin and Annie that they were interested in this project. So that's that's our background and um, just a fantastic, fantastic movie. So um, maybe I just get started with the Q&A and, and kind of start with the end of the movie and, and maybe ask you, Justin, to talk about how you captured that final scene. It was an amazing scene. And, and just the authenticity and the emotion was just, it like burst through the film, but just the authenticity of, of Stacy and her mom was, was amazing. How, how were you able to do that, capture that? So what's funny is, you know, when we originally went to their, to Grant Township for the first time, you know, we were talking to them about hellbenders and, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of had a lot of experience working with hellbenders and stuff. So I was like describing these things to Judy and Stacy, and they were just like losing their mind. Like I was just telling them facts and like weird things that they had no idea that ever happened. You know, like the males guard the nests, or like the males fight each other at a certain time of year. They're like feisty little things, and like it just kind of reaffirmed a lot of the beliefs that they had about the hellbender because they used obviously used it as their mascot. And so based on that conversation, and then when she said, you know, during the interview that she had never seen one and her wishes is to hold one, um, 
we were like, that's going to happen. You know, where <laughs> we secretly as a crew, we're like, we're going to make that happen. Uh, we didn't say anything to them. We didn't mention to them that we're going to try to make that a thing. But uh, yeah, so it, it took us, you know, a little bit of planning and everything. And finally, we got connected to Matt, who did an absolutely wonderful job in making that happen. Um, and you'll get to meet him a little bit later. But, you know, a true professional in his craft, he was able to get us a hellbender very, very quickly. Um, usually they're very difficult to find. Um, but he, you know, got us got the hellbender so we coordinated with that and got them out there in the field they're really excited you know and then being able to like actually see the thing that you know was kind of pushing them giving them that that mascot to give a face to their their organization and their movement they were finally able to like hold it and see it and you know look at the thing and they kept commenting about how big it was they thought it was much bigger than what they had thought although the one that we had caught was a pretty big hellbender <laughs> compared to most average hellbenders um so it was really really rewarding to see that um all play out you know and again thanks to thanks to matt for making that happen you know we, they absolutely loved it from what i understood and they you know it, it really made the end of the film when stacy was like oh you we you think we saved it we're like yep you definitely did because if there was a injection well right here it would be impacting that hellbender's habitat and so um yeah it was really really rewarding and it was great to be there and see it all unfold yeah amazing yeah maybe we can move to the guy that made it happen matt um <laughs> maybe we could get a little sense for your history and how you came to study hellbenders and i know you're a scientist but i'm sure emotionally you're attached to this to this species so maybe you could give us a little background on that and some of the comments you made specifically about the resilience of the species. And, and also I'm curious about the physiology or the biology of the species. Why did, why do those two things make it an indicator of environmental health? Sure. Um, yeah. So I, I grew up in Western PA. Um, I was always interested in the outdoors and reptiles and amphibians. I spent a lot of time growing up along the Allegheny river in Northwestern PA, which didn't know at the time, but that's really a hotbed for hellbenders. So it, didn't take me a long time to to find one and that really kind of set the set the stage for where I'm at now. Um, I've had a number of jobs in the south dealing with other other reptiles and amphibians but it always kind of stuck in my head you know I'd love to go back and work in my home state with all these declines and all these these pressing issues going on with the hellbender and um, so I was able to find a really great lab here at Ohio University that you know was open to starting some of these projects and I've been lucky to be able to work on a number of different things you know, for the past five, six years. So very, very, very grateful to be a part of that in my home state and some of the streams I grew up in playing as a boy and, um, you know, happy to be part of this film as well. Um, so yeah, as a, hellbenders are, you know, as I said in the film, very unique species in a lot of ways, um, very understudied. Um, and uh, they're often considered an indicator species. Uh, you know, they're very long lived. They're, uh, you know, broadly sensitive to habitat disturbance. So that kind of funnels into them being an indicator species. If you basically have a, a dense population with a, you know, um, a, a, a really a, a spread out, you know, size distribution with active reproduction, that's a very good symbol that the, the stream overall is doing well. Um, so re really, um, if you see young individuals, that's really a good sign that the stream is doing well, because we know that declines are due to limited recruitment, okay? Mm -hmm. so. Hellbender populations are declining. It's not as simple as people might think. You know, people think there's something entering the stream. They're maybe dying directly. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So we know that something's wrong with either recruitment or reproduction. So often they're touted as the canary in the coal mine, an early warning signal of these you know, streams degrading. But more precisely, these declines are kind of a late warning signal, if you really think about it, because this is things have been persisting in the environment for so long. And Hellbenders have been declining over the past several decades. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Maybe, uh, Chad, we can move on to you because someone asked a question, Natalie asked the question, can someone explain the law that the township came up with to get the permit withdrawn? Maybe we could bolt that on to another question we had, which is how did the community find out about and decide to adopt a home rule charter? And what was the press process like for them? And maybe I would ask another, I would add, add on to that. The role of rights of nature's in the, in their fight was that something as at the original outset of this fight, or did it come in later? 
Yeah, thanks, Ted. And also thanks to the filmmakers and to Matt and Paul Harm and Frack Tracker for everybody's involvement in all this. Um, I, I think it's been a really beautiful, um, yeah, just showing of uh, the resistance and resilience of the folks in Grant Township. So just to put those things out there. Um, also, I just want to start by saying, as of today, there is no injection well in Grant Township. So for those of you who are willing to turn your cameras on and uh, maybe give a quick round of applause, um, please do. Um, I don't think Stacey or Judy are on this call, but um, yeah, uh, just a big show of support for all the work that they put in over the years. Um, it's huge. So, um, and it's been a, a yeah effort that has been supported by many people. So thanks to um, obviously Judy and Stacy and everybody for supporting them. Um, I think, yeah, to get to the, the legal stuff, it's a little uh, complicated, but I'll do my best and try to keep it as um, simple as I can. Uh, I first got a call from Judy in 2014. Um, and it was not a, a fun call. She wanted me to do something um, uh, through the Legal Defense Fund that uh, we didn't do, which was essentially try to appeal permits that had been issued for these, these activities. So the injection well cannot take place without a permit from the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level or without a permit from the Department of Environmental Protection at the state level. And she was asking us basically to provide assistance with appealing these permits. Our organization's history over the years has found that communities, when they try to appeal permits, usually end up losing. They don't get what they want. They get the project. At best, they're left arguing over the where and the why and the how it's going to proceed. It's not about actually stopping it. It's about negotiating how much harm is going to um, be placed within the community. And so Judy, um, as you probably got a sense of her through the film, uh, wasn't happy with my explanation and uh, had a, had a few few things to say to me. Um, and I said, look, I'm sorry, you know, we will help you with this other avenue if you want, which is essentially to create a local law that says, no, we don't want it. We're not going to stand for it. We don't want it in any form um, because this is harmful to our community and to the ecosystems. And we're not going to screw around with the where it's going to be placed, how much uh, frack waste per day is going to be put down the well, any of that stuff. And uh, she thought about it and got back with me um, a couple of weeks later. And then I was on a, a, you know, drove up to Grant Township and presented a, a township meeting. And so I'm going to try to speed things up as much as I can. The first law that we wrote with the community was an ordinance. At that time, they were what's called a second class township in Pennsylvania. Um, and they passed it in June of 2014. And it said no injection wells. And it wasn't just a no. It wasn't just a ban. It also said we, the people of the community, have certain rights. Uh, we have the right to clean air, to clean water and a healthy environment. The ecosystems here have rights as well, rights of nature, which Ted mentioned, um, and we have a right to local self-government. We have the right to be the ones that determine our future here, not some out-of-area corporation. We're the ones that get to be in charge of what we do, uh, where we live, and we don't want our uh, water supplies threatened. So, so we worked with them to draft that. Um, and it got passed in June of 2014. They were sued um, two months later in August of 2014, originally uh, in federal court by PGE, Pennsylvania General Energy. That's a corporation that is still intending to dump frack waste within the community. Um, that first case went about as we expected, which is that uh, they lost in federal court. Um, the judge in that case, uh, her name is Susan Paradise Baxter, um, up until a couple of months before she took the case, she had a stock holdings in a subsidiary of Halliburton Corporation. So I think it you know, probably gives folks a, an indication of uh, where her interests lie. So you had a judge that had interest in oil and gas. You had um, the state law, which basically said you have to accept this, and the federal uh, EPA, which uh, allowed the, the permit to be placed in the first place. And you had all these things that were crashing down in this community. So they lost in 2015. Um, but they went further and they adopted what Ted mentioned was a home rule charter, which is a, a um, something that's offered to all municipalities in Pennsylvania. 
uh, was put into place in the late 60s, uh, which allows communities to essentially create their own local charter. It's a local constitution. Um, right now, if you're not home rule, it's essentially the government you get that was written by legislators 100 years ago. Under a charter, you get to actually adopt the government that you want. You get to elect people to come together to hold community meetings, decide what you want in your government, what you don't want in your government, and then you get to have a popular vote on what your government actually looks like. So it's true democracy in its barest form. Um, and that's what they did. And so they adopted this law in 2015. It was only a month after the judge stripped out the provisions in their first law and said, no, you don't get to do this. That's what the judge said. And the community said, hey, sorry, um, the big, big middle finger and said, you know, actually, we're going to reinstate a new law and adopt a new form of government that reinstates the ban. And we're going to say no to the injection well again. So let's go. Um, I'm going to wrap this up very quickly, as, as quickly as I can. Two years later, the State Department of Environmental Protection sued Grant Township over their new local law, which banned injection wells. So the state DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, sued Grant Township for trying to protect its environment. It's the, the barest bones, um, you know, way I can help people understand how our government works, which is you have the state DEP and the federal judge all crashing down on this community, trying to get them to submit and to forcibly put frack waste, to toxic frack waste into this community. And yet the community still didn't submit. They said, fine, we're going to court again. And we've been representing them in that case uh, since that time as well, which is now before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. In addition, though, and then what I want to make very, 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 very clear is that this isn't just a legal strategy. This is an organizing strategy, which is that Judy and Stacy, the hell vendors, the township supervisors have all been relentless in not just waiting for these lawsuits to come to them. They've been pushing forward and saying, we don't really, frankly, care what the law says if it's telling us we have to have toxic waste dumped into our water supply. We don't accept that as legitimate, and we will continue to push forward. That also include a first in the nation law, um, which they passed in 2016, which legalized nonviolent direct action. It said, we are going to allow people to come into our community to actually physically obstruct the dumping of waste, and we will uh, protect them because we think this is that important. It's about protecting our rights. It's about protecting the rights of nature. It's about protecting the community members that live here. It's about protecting the water. And so, you know, just to say this isn't just about like doing laws and hoping that you're going to get the best of the courts because history has shown us that the courts, you know, historically in this uh, country have not been the ones that protect our environment or the communities. It's only until there's physical resistance that says we're not doing it here. And so I just want to say that, you know, it is a legal strategy. I'm happy to go into it more with folks want. But um, it's also been about a concerted organizing strategy of pushing forward on the media front. And also saying, look, you know, it's just not going to happen here. Um, and we're going to do everything we can within our power to make sure that it doesn't. Yeah, maybe that's why they're trying to pass critical infrastructure bills everywhere for that very same reason. Um, so, hey, Matt, um, a question came up from AC about are there any other areas in the world you can find hellbenders? And, and maybe I would ask, I would add on to that, like the, the film talks about the Ozark population versus the Appalachian population, maybe you and or Justin could kind of flesh out the differences between those in, in as simple terms as you can. Sure, yeah, so uh, as I said in the film, the historic range of the Hellbender is basically Southern New York to Northern Georgia and West out to the Ozarks. Um, so they were, you know, historically found in streams throughout that area, throughout the Appalachians and, and Ozarks. Um, now they're really restricted to core populations. There's certain maps that kind of show there's sort of a thin strip. Uh, there's good populations, in Northern Georgia, um, southeast or southwestern Virginia, some pockets of West Virginia on up to northwestern PA, but it's the range has been drastically reduced over the past couple of years where we really find dense reproductively active populations. So I guess the answer is yes, you still can find them, you know, uh, across most of those areas, but uh, not in the, you know, population uh, structures and, and size that they have had in the past. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Justin, do you want to add, add anything to that? Um, yeah, just for the Ozark Hellbender, it is a different species. It is found in Missouri, um, and that one has a much 
lower population. And so that is afforded a lot more protection than the Eastern Hellbender. So in this, in this film, we focus on the Eastern Hellbender and the Ozark Hellbender. Its population, if you look at that little range map, it's that splash over in Missouri is where that lives in the Ozark Mountain Range versus the Appalachian Mountain Range. Mm, yeah. Um, maybe uh, as a, a question was asked from the group, uh, Ann Simmons asked the question, what can we do to support the efforts of this Hellbender group? Uh, Chad, maybe if you want to take that. The Hellbender Society, Easter Run Hellbender Society probably is what she's referring to. Sure. Um, I think the, I mean, the easiest, well, easiest things, um, none of this is easy, would be to just send letters of support. Um, I think uh, Justin and Tanoi and other folks from um, the filmmakers have been working on doing uh, postcards and things like that just to let the community know that they're still supported. You know, a Grant Township, 700 people. Um, and so just making sure that they have support from, um, you know, other folks. The second piece is um, donations. Uh, there are ongoing legal costs that the hellbenders are incurring, that the township is incurring. Um, you know, that we're incurring as we continue to stand with them. And so um, money, you know, is always something that uh, like helps with these efforts. Um, there is a um, event on April 20th in um, Indiana, which is kind of the nearest bigger city um, in Grant Township, uh, near Grant Township uh, to show the film. Um, and it's near the University, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, promoting that. And then there's also likely an event that's going to be happening in um, in May to try to get people together who have supported Grant Township over the years. So I think those are, you know, is to just let folks up there know that you stand with them, that you support them, send them um, donations if you can, because this stuff's not free. Um, but the bigger thing, I think, is honestly to take this up where you live. Um, I know that there's a lot of folks that are kind of have been sitting around for many years watching and kind of waiting to see what happens up there. Are they going to win? Or is the injection well going to come in? And um, that that is support in its own way. But the bigger thing would be for this to bloom into a larger movement where people are taking up the types of actions that those in Grant Township have done into their own communities and stop watching and looking at what other people are doing and take yeah. action where we live um, to protect what's important to us. I think that's the biggest and mo most important thing. And so if folks are really interested in doing that, you know, we at the Legal Defense Fund are ha happy to help with that. I think Halt the Harm and, you know, uh, Frack Tracker would also be interested so there's a lot of resources here, but that's the thing is we can't wait around and, and watch. Um, we have to be willing to stand up for what's important where we live. And that's what I think the help vendors have done the best. Yeah, uh, maybe a couple more questions. It sounds like we have time for that. Uh, Matt, I have a question for you. What are some of the scientific challenges in connecting the damage done to river systems to fracking operations and injection wells specifically, but just more broadly, what, what are the biggest challenges that you found in your work looking at hellbender salamanders just to getting the data you need? Sure. Um, I'm sure somebody else could probably answer these fracking questions a little bit better than me, but my, my general understanding is, um, you know, if you, if you want to look at the landscape level effects of fracking, it could be pretty difficult just taking, you know, Pennsylvania as an example. There's been such a long history of degradation and different land uses and everything, so there really are no reference watersheds to basically set up uh, a scientific study to be able to compare, to isolate the effects of fracking infrastructure. Um, so while we know, you know, broadly that the, the fracking impacts are, you know, detrimental to, to aquatic land, aquatic ecosystems, there's a lot of confounding things you can, you can run into there if you wanted to just compare. So, um, and even, even more so is, you know, we know that fracking activity is likely not great for hellbenders, but there's so many equations on both sides of that equation that it could be hard to parse out, you know, directly just publishing a paper related to that. We know very little about hellbender biology in relation to other more well-studied species like an alligator or a white-tailed deer, for instance. But, and then, you know, obviously on the other side too, we really, um, you know, we, we need more concerted efforts to maybe set up some experimental stuff to look at this. So hellbenders in general are, are hard to study or live under big rocks in the bottom of the stream, often in remote areas spread out. So um, they're very cryptic, very, very hard to find in certain scenarios. So 
Um, it's not as easy as just going out and collecting a little streamside salamander, for instance. So there's a lot of logistical issues that come into this work, especially most of the work we were doing was centered around artificial nest boxes. So basically putting in these 100 pound concrete nest boxes in these remote areas of the stream. So that presented difficulties. And then given how little they move, given how long lived they are and other aspects of their basic ecology, data returns are pretty slim, at least when you're trying to start up work, work like this. So this is a long-term sort of monitoring setup that we've, we've been moving towards and uh, hopefully be able to continue this over the next several years or maybe even decades so we can actually get some robust data sets to be able to look at some of these things. Yeah, I mean, from my from my mind, having spent a lot of time down there, it's the gathering the, the pipelines, the gathering lines that the states are approving at this you know at the state level. There's a lot of focus on transmission pipelines, which you know rightly so. But to me, in the place I know very well, these gathering pipelines are ubiquitous, and they 25 to 35 percent slopes. I mean, Justin, you saw them, so it's to me that that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of surface disturbance. It's these pipelines, but yeah. Um, it's back to the guy that made the movie, Justin, um, maybe my final question for you or a good final question for you would be, you went into this movie with some sort of like a priori, like, you know, hypothesis about what you were going to find and, and your, your, your feelings about the sal salamander, this particular salamander, how, how did it, did any of those ever change or like, were they modified? What did you come away from this movie thinking, feeling that you didn't know you were going to feel or think prior to? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I guess in terms of the Hellbender, you know, I, you know, I went into this film really respecting the species and you know being very fond of its habitat, its riparian ecosystem, and understanding the importance of clean water and all that kind of stuff. And also going in, you know, with the understanding that humans and wildlife and habitat and ecosystem are all linked together you can't have one without the other you know if you have bad habitat your people are going to suffer so going into the film that was kind of the story you know we were hoping to highlight but you know because of the inspiring work that judy and stacy and the people of grant township have done and the help from the from cell deaf and everything that's kind of like where we sort of focus the story because then it was like this very powerful positive story about how a community was actually able or is currently working on protecting all that kind of stuff so that they can be healthy and happy and flourish in the community, the environment and everything that they built for themselves. And so, yeah, when we went into the film, you know, usually, you know, when we go into films as the production company, we have like some sort of an impact in mind. There's like an end goal that we start with and then we decide how can that film sort of get us to where we want to go. A lot of people who make films are like, oh, I just want to do something cool or I want to be creative or I want to, ex you know, explore some inner thing within myself. But we make films as a very conservation approach where we have that, you know, results chain and we want to see something happen with this film. And so, you know, coming out of the story and things that, you know, that sort of changed and meandered a little bit. But really, it's about connecting communities together, sharing a positive message and trying to get everyone, you know, feeling empowered that they could do something that they can fight back and then using Judy and Stacy and Grant Township as that sort of story to really get people to be like, wow, that they could do it, I can do it. And so that would kind of get people to explore opportunities in their area if they're experiencing environmental injustice. So yeah, you know, going in, we didn't have that fleshed out or as clear in our brain, but because our you know, interviews with Grant Township and the work and everything that we've done with everybody else that kind of came out with the end of the film. Hmm. Uh, there was one question. So this is your your uh, shameless plug opportunity. What are plans for distribution of the film? Uh, we're still kind of working on distribution right now. It's available on World Wildlife Day's film showcase. It's uh, it's put on by Jackson Wild, the UN, CITES. Um, so it's like you we can send a link out for everybody to see it there if you want. So right now it's available online for free, but you have to sign up. You can also vote if you watch it over there too, or if you want to see it again or you want to share it with someone, you could vote on your favorite film. So we're up for an audience choice award. So that's another a shameless plug within a shameless plug. Um, so you can watch it there. 
I think right now our big distribution plan is just to get it in front of as many communities as we can. And so doing panels just like this, hosting screenings, making it available for really anyone who wants to see it. That's kind of our plan, especially now as the people of Grand Township are kind of going into this next court case, which is still yet to be scheduled, trying to build up as much you know, energy and community around them in this film as possible going into that. Uh, so we're just trying to share it as much as we can. We have a couple events that we might, that we're going to try to start planning here soon, maybe at the end of summer to get people together to do some screenings, maybe some demonstrations. Um, so we're hitting it hard, you know, over the, the course of the next few months to try to get this out. But um, other than that, you know, it's, like I said, available online for free. Uh, you can have a private screening of your own. Just send us a message. Um, yeah. Thanks. It was really inspirational, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've answered everyone's questions. Yep, looks like it. Um, thanks, y'all, for having that wonderful panel discussion. I'm going to take everyone off spotlight and bring us back to the full group right now. Um, really appreciate uh, the discussion. That was very informative to me. I thought it was a powerful film and I, I really appreciated all the insights you guys added and the, the stories you guys added. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're at the hour. So um, anyone who wants to leave is welcome to, but we're gonna take a few minutes to record some very short messages for Stacy and Judy, words of encouragement as you saw from Chad's discussion that the kind of the struggle is ongoing and we'll be continuing for a while. And it, it's good to show our support in whatever way possible. So. Um, I'll pass it to Justin real quick to kind of talk about um, what we can do for Stacey and Judy with that. And I'm going to drop some more links in the chat real quick to how you can support things um, by signing up for a screening and the action toolkit that um, Hellbent uh, has, or Hellbenders have um, put out there to, to support them in different ways. So Justin. Yeah, so what we're kind of going to do now is like a fun activity for people who are still around here. Um, like Chad mentioned, you know, being supportive, among other things. Donating is another great thing to do. So sell deaf, um, you can donate there. There's uh, some donation links to our website, Hellbent Film. But, you know, the easiest, quickest way that we can show our support right now is just to record a quick message um, but about your thoughts about their fight and what you think about the film and their role in the film and who they are and what Grand Township stands for. Um, I will like to flag that Judy is actually on this right now. So your letter of support is more direct than you may think. Uh, but we're still going to try and record some of these and put, to, put them together in a nice, nice little video to show that there's a community behind them and that everybody is wishing them best of luck and hoping to push their, their case forward so that it ends up being what they're hoping for and what we're all kind of hoping for. So yeah, we're on record now. Um, Kevin, what would be best for this? Do you want to let people come off mute? Or do you want to do it yourself? I think the best way is if whoever wants to record a message, just use the raise your hand function. So if you go to the menu at the bottom where it says reactions, click on reaction and raise hand. And we'll kind of, and maybe Justin just call them kind of one by one to, to make their, to give their um, quick words of support to Judy and Stacy. Does that sound good? Yeah. And these could be really short. They could be, you know, 10 seconds, just, you know, something like, you know, great job in the film. We really support what you're doing. We're excited about your work and we hope it goes very well for you. You know, something like that. It doesn't have to be super long winded. So I'm just kind of scanning through the video. So if anybody wants to go, feel free to raise your hand. Hmm. I think we have Tamla is up first. Um, and then also, if you have trouble getting the raise the hand function, drop a message in the chat is, is also good too. But yeah, Tamla is up first. Well, I just want to congratulate you guys for everything that you've accomplished. And I know the fight is still moving on, but what a wonderful um, opportunity to celebrate what you have accomplished. And I so appreciate you and taking care of not just the hellbenders, but all the other organisms and life in that area and motivating us to do the same. Thank you. Perfect. 
And I got Z2837 up next. Oh, looks like, oh, there we go. I'm mute. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Judy and Stacy, this is Barb from Warren. Um, just want to let you know, this month is one year since I've been doing the full moon for you guys. It took us 20 months to get the bad guys out of our place, so have faith. Cool. And then Mike Allen. Yes, hi. This is Mike Mike Allen from Florence, Oregon. I, I want to say to Judy and Stacy, uh, watching you in action have been an inspiration to my myself and my wife Pat, who have been battling issues on climate uh, change in in our local community. Uh, you've given us the uh, resolve to stay with the fight. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, now we're going to go to Joanne. Hi, this is Joanne Hackes. I'm from uh, Evergreen, Colorado, and uh, I think it's a, just a fabulous story you folks are doing. Such a good job. Um, we're battling some of the same issues here in Colorado with the, the huge expansion of fracking all, all across our state. And... Um, it's nice to know that some, there's been a few victories once in a while. So thanks very much for what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, do one too. Well, if, if any other folks want to, um, can raise their hands. So uh, my name is Kim Richardson. I'm from Dallas, Texas area. We're right next to a, a huge area of fracking on the Barnett Shell. Um, it's pretty bad air pollution, pretty bad um, situation of just passing more and more wells to be fracked. And listening to your story was so inspiring. Um, that gave me hope and I uh, loved your resolve and your fights. And I just wanna say that we're you know, we're with you, we support you and um, I'm incredibly inspired by it. So thank you so much. And if anyone else wants to record a message, you know, feel free to raise your hand or even just come off mute and uh, kind of talk about it. We'll give a, another minute or two for anyone who um, wants to do it to, to record a message. Pat, yeah, you can go ahead. My message is pretty simple. Um, I used to live in Ohio, was raised there. It was a great farm state at that point. I now live in Philadelphia. It's horrible to see what's happening in that part of our country. I just wanted to say good luck with all of your efforts. God bless. Take care. Amazing. Thank you. Judy, um, I can see you uh, scribing in there, and this is Chad, um, and, you know, I'll address you as the Queen Mother, which is how I know you, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, just thank you for arguing with me um, back on that March day in 2014. Looking forward to more arguments. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a direct link to the action toolkit in there for different ways. There are like five different ways to um, support them. So feel free to look at that. And yeah, we'll just keep open, keep open for a few more minutes, see if anyone else wants to report a message. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I feel really inspired, and that was um, an incredible film and incredible discussion. And the, the kind of last moment of sharing each other's words of support for, for Judy and Stacey was also really inspiring. Um, big thanks to Justin for putting the film together. 
doing such a wonderful job. Um, thanks to Ted, Chad, and Matt for all the things they've done. Um, in, in addition to joining us tonight, everything you've been involved in the organizing and the scientific aspects of it. Uh, just wonderful work. Big thank you to Stacy and Judy for being out there and fighting these things. Um, uh, you know, Halt Harm Network and Frack Tracker, we believe so much in grassroots organizing is the key to protecting ourselves from the harms of oil and gas pollution and for climate change. And, you know, your, your story is inspiring and I'm, I'm really happy to learn from it. Um, yeah, thank you everyone to, uh, for being involved. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. We'll uh, edit the recording and send it out within the next day or two uh, with the actions and how to um, watch the film again. Feel, I encourage you all to share the recording and the film with others and, and talk about the story. Uh, and the link we sent to watch the film is on the network. You're, uh, you encourage folks to write comments or questions there if you have follow-up questions or want to connect with people that you met um, during the event. So it's a great way to stay involved. Um, and yeah, thank you. Everyone have a great rest of their afternoon. Um, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for us. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Bye, everyone.